All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. This is the first interview of the year. I'm excited to get back to things. We had an amazing first year and hopefully we'll have an even uh, bigger second year. As you know, you got to hit subscribe, support the channel. And if you want to ask questions of my guests, go to the Patreon link in the description, select the appropriate tier, and then you can ask the guests the question. So we're kicking off the year. How many people are ready for the big Bullet Boys original lineup reunion? Well, you might be a little disappointed. Mick Sweeta is here to talk about that and much more right after this. Just All right, let's welcome Mick Sweeta. There you are, Mick. Hold on. Well, first of all, Happy New Year, and I'm glad that you're back. Yeah, Happy New Year to you. It's nice to see you. Yeah, and uh, I, I was saying to you before, uh, 9,000 people watched our first interview. It was really, uh, a lot of people enjoyed it. And I want to make sure that people who might be uh, tuning into this for the first time understand that in our first interview, we talked about the history of the Bullet Boys and the albums. We talked about King Cobra. Um, we talked about your band, The Hot Summers, which we'll talk about more. Um, so if people are looking for more about a history uh, of your career, that first interview, there'll be a link at the end and there's a link in the description. Um, today, we're sort of catching up on, uh, in our first interview, we talked about the original lineup of the Bullet Boys getting back together. And I asked you, should we get out there and buy our tickets? Uh, and see it because maybe it won't be around. And you did stress that maybe it's a good idea to see it uh, um, when you can. So you you recently made a statement on on the Facebook. You know, all the kids are on the Facebook. And then, the yeah, and then you ended up, uh, you know, you're on the whirlwind media tour, you know, talking to people in their living rooms like me. And the rock news world is clamoring to know what is happening with the Bullet Boys. You are the person who knows, you can tell us, but I wanna go back a little bit to sort of get an understanding of how we got to where we are. Um, last year, you guys were playing shows and the reviews were really good. People were enjoying it. People were excited to see the original lineup back together. There was a cancellation. Did somebody in the band get sick? Uh, I believe that, yeah, that was the case, absolutely. Yeah. Because it yeah. seemed like it was just obviously it's a pandemic and traveling is hard and people were getting sick. But with your yeah. band, we panic when we hear a cancellation. Yeah, I, I totally understand. It was uh, it was very unfortunate and it was all last minute. So uh, it hit kind of hard. I mean, you, if you have a chance to prepare for things like that, I suppose it uh, makes it easier. But yeah, it was uh, it was very unfortunate. But it seemed like we were able to overcome that setback yeah no you went you were right back on the road and then i thought okay this is not the end of the uh the bullet boys now fast forward to the end of the year i was in california bullet boys were set to play the whiskey at the last second in the afternoon you announced that uh the show would not be going on and then later the whiskey announced that mark torian will play uh, an acoustic set. So you tell me what exactly happened. Well, uh, evidently Lonnie wasn't able to make the flight. And so in our conversations, we decided that because it wasn't going to be the original band, because we didn't really want to replace him and have somebody come up and, and scab at the last minute. And that just wasn't an option for us. So we decided it would be best to just cancel the, the set. Um, well, as you might have predicted, um, Mark went against the advice of, of everybody that we talked to and, and everybody in the band and decided that he was going to, in his words, save the show. So I'm not sure what happened down there. I've heard stories, um, but uh, that was, uh, the whole event was unfortunate and the way it turned out, I. I would call that unfortunate too, because people weren't really uh, expecting to see that. So uh, not sure how it turned out, but uh, I don't think it was like the four of us going down and laying out the grooves. 
Yeah, I, and I'm glad that you um, you clear it up because to someone from the outside, you wonder, well, if Mark played acoustic, well, why didn't the other guys decide to play acoustic? And your answer um, explains that. Yeah, it's uh, our music isn't acoustic. We've done acoustic sets before. I've never been a fan of them. Uh, I know it was a, a big thing at one point early in our career, but uh, that's that's not the way this music should be presented. And, and anything less than what we normally do and what we're accustomed to, I think would be a disappointment for anybody watching it. Yeah. Now I heard, and this is all rumor through the grapevine, that Lonnie was sort of missing in action, so to speak. But did you guys know he missed his flight or, or how did that go? Uh, no, he was missing in action. So okay. we had no idea what was happening. And obviously the first thing we think about is his welfare. Um, and at this point I haven't talked to him. So hopefully everything's good with him. And he's known for this a little bit though. Uh, you could say it isn't the first time. Yeah, he's disappeared um, before. And as you said, he does have issues with health. And so we hope that he's, uh, you know, uh, that he's doing doing well. Did you speak to him at all since that whiskey show? Uh, no, no, I didn't speak to him before or after. So, uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunate the way things happened, but hopefully he's uh, safe and sound and doing well. Who? I I hate to laugh. It's just this rock and roll world is so crazy. When do you even find out that he missed his flight? Uh, we were still hoping to play the show that morning. And uh, so I guess you would say noonish day of the show. I, at that point, we decided that wasn't going to happen no matter what. So, um, but yeah, like you said, rock and roll. It's it's basically a journey where pretty much every day you get to a point where nothing surprises you. Mm -hmm. Although it still happens to me sometimes. Call me naive, but uh, there is a point where it's just like. <laughs> I could have told you that. In fact, you know, a lot of my friends will talk to me about, well, aren't you excited? Aren't you excited? Not really. Not until the day that or the moment that we're there and doing it because anything can happen. I thought you were optimistic, obviously cautious as well because of how much you've been through. And sadly, history seems to repeat itself. I had Mark Knight from Bang Tango on a few weeks ago, and his story is very similar about getting off the, the sinking ship, if you will. And uh, and it's funny because I said, what a great bill it would be again to have Bang Tango and Bullet Boys, all original, back together like the good old days. And it, um, and again, history sort of repeating itself. So you've made the decision, and Jimmy Dean, the, the original drummer as well, not to continue with Bullet Boys. When did that decision uh, come about? Well, I... I was, like you said, cautiously optimistic. I, I don't think there's even a word in the English language for the position that I was in because I, I don't want to use hope. I don't want to use, uh, you know, optimistic. It's, it's, I don't think there's a word for, for how you feel because you really have to temper virtually everything, uh, every bit of news, every everything you hear. Um, so I, I would say that prior to the whiskey gig i my reservations were uh profound and it's when jimmy told me that he wasn't going to continue and then our management uh bailed uh that was pretty much it for me although you know after playing the whiskey gig i thought maybe anything could change um but again you know the naivete is is uh strong with this one yeah, well said. Uh, so take me through it. When is the last time you actually spoke to Mark? Uh, that would have been the day that the whiskey was supposed to take place. Do you... I think he suggested at that time that he was going to go down and, and he wanted me to go with him. And I said, that's not, that's not bullet boys, but I guess he felt like he was going to go and, and satisfy, you know, whatever, uh, whatever, to guarantee so whatever, was. Fans, whatever the fans were going to expect. And he was probably thinking, I'll save part of the guarantee that we're going to lose if nobody shows up is my hunch. Uh, yeah, I think that was monetarily influenced. I'd say probably 99%. So 
do you tell him you're done at that point or does he find out on Facebook like the rest of the world? Uh, I think that he pretty much expected that that was going to happen. I mean, who's to say that this wasn't part of a plan, you know, in the beginning that, you know, at the first opportunity he was going to, uh, you know, find a way to go back to having his uh, subservient musicians playing, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, and frankly, it doesn't interest me at all at this point. Frankly, I feel a huge sense of relief and a sense of weight lifted off my shoulders every time uh, I leave this band. <laughs> it's because it's it can be nerve wracking and, and stomach churning. And uh, it, it's just there's no need for it in my life at this point. I've got the hot summers and plenty of other things I can be doing. And so uh, that's what I will be doing. Yeah, I, uh, you know, we should stress it wasn't like this was your this was how you were going to pay your rent for the rest of the year. Uh, this was not, you, you know, your soul living. It was nice to make some extra money, maybe. And it was nice to give fans what they want to see and have a good time and play the music that you, uh, you know, wrote as a unit. And uh, so to leave, uh, and no, no matter m money is worth being miserable and then putting yourself through situations that you've been through. You've said in the past that you believe that that Mark had sabotaged the band early on uh, several times. So I can understand why you would feel this time like this is another a repeat of history. Yeah, it's and and it seems to have persisted through to to this uh, version of the group. Uh, I always felt like I was spending more time doing damage control um, from the very beginning uh, than I was enjoying it. So it's it's funny, and I'm sure we've talked about it before. People, people are like, well, dude, just go play music. Why can't you guys just get it together and go out and have fun and play music? Well, were it so easy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh... You know, I always say also these bands in the prime, some of them were three years, four years, five years, whatever it was. And then you take all these years apart. Then to just go back, sometimes you, you, you're reminded of why you didn't do it in the first, why it didn't last the first time around. It's like dating somebody. You, you, you ah, I'll get back together. Then you realize, oh, that's why we're not together because we hate each other, you know, uh, or yeah. it's difficult. Yeah, to, to further that analogy, uh, when you go out to dinner and you're sitting and you're having a good time, maybe it's all great. Maybe that's that's what makes it worthwhile. And the rest of the time, it's just pure misery. And and in the case of this band, that's that's kind of how it is. You know, the shows were great. We were having a great time. People were responding. It seemed like there was a the potential for an upward trajectory. And uh, as soon as and and these aren't my words. This is somebody who's very close with us and observing it. It's like when you guys are in a room, everything seems to be great and have fun. As soon as everybody gets apart, that's when, you know, the voices in people's ears start speaking and, and the noise starts to have an effect. And, and really that's, that's the way it was, you know, as soon as, as soon as we finished the gig, that's when everything started to slide downhill. Yeah. And it's such a shame. Sometimes you can bring in somebody to, who can deal with it, but sometimes the personalities are too much where um, I'm not sure anyone could even referee that type of um, situation. And so I, I'm assuming Mark continues. There, there are Bullet Boy shows that were supposed to happen next week or this weekend. Um, they're canceled from what I see. Um, do you think the plan is that he'll continue with, you know, a scab Bullet Boys? Oh, I know that's the plan. And I would caution anybody who wants to go to those shows to disregard whatever photos you see, disregard whatever uh, press or whatever comments you might see from promoters uh, suggesting it's in a, the original band because it won't be. Uh, I'd, I'll be surprised if uh, if Lonnie will be partaking. So um, be aware, go have fun, enjoy the show, but don't expect the original band to be there. Yeah. And people should understand that you're doing these interviews and you do you did your announcement, not because you're trying to uh, stir things up. I'm sure there's better things you can do in your day than talk about the Bullet Boys. But it is to let people know that it did not work out and that if their people are coming and spending their money to see the original Bullet Boys, um, that is not what they're going to see. And also to say your side of what you had to go through. 
And, and that's absolutely true. I mean, you, you have to get ahead of these things. Otherwise, they can uh, create a lot more work uh, on the back end. And, and I get it. You know, there's always somebody who's going to be like, oh, my God, who cares? Who cares? Right. And that's always like the Aussie fan. You know, it's like somebody who loves GMC cars going onto a Toyota site and talking about how sucky Toyotas are. I mean, just just go where you want to go and have fun there as opposed to showing up and, and talking about, you know, how irrelevant somebody might be. The point is that there are plenty of people that are, were excited to see us, that there are plenty of people who still will go. And uh, I just want to make sure that they understand what they're getting and and who they're going to see. Yeah, a- absolutely. And I think it's important um, to put it there because like you said, nowadays, once one person's comment all of a sudden can change um, the history of things. And so it's good to be on the record for um, for what you went through. And so uh, I, I want to say, and then we'll talk about the hot summers a little bit, but I want to say, I kept thinking, well, we're going to tell a negative story. Where can we find uh, a positive in all this negative? Uh, and, and, I've, and I think I found the answer, and that's raising some awareness. Your son, Easton Rocket Sweeta, is on General Hospital, you know, one of the biggest soap operas of all time. Your son was born with autism. He was nonverbal until four years old. Uh, He's now on General Hospital and he portrays a character who just recently was diagnosed with autism on the show. And uh, what an amazing story. You must be such a proud father. And what a great way to raise awareness um, to that. So I'd like if you would just talk a little bit about this uh, crazy experience. Well, it's the realization of a fantasy. Actually, my uh, my son started doing some print and and he did a couple of commercials. In fact, he was in a commercial with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio at one point. So that was a pretty big event. But he was doing really well. I mean, he's a he's a great little model. Um, And my wife and I would always talk about, well, wouldn't it be great if he could just get a part that was written for him where, where people are are hoping to portray autism uh, in a realistic fashion, as opposed to an actor who's just studied it and has a basic understanding of of some some you know particular range of the spectrum, which is is very wide. I mean, there are people that can't function at all. There are people that can't feed themselves, and there are people that can do math. You know, like my son, he doesn't want to deal with any numbers less than a billion, and. He, it was it was very interesting how this came about because we do these video auditions and for the most part they they rarely turn out to the point where my wife is like oh my god here's another one oh well we'll just do it well they fell in love with him that day the next day they called him and uh, wanted him to be a part of the show and it's gone swimmingly ever since he's he's uh, working with uh, one actor whose son is autistic, and, and this guy is his TV dad, and he understands exactly what Easton's. The people that watch General Hospital are pretty much in love with him. I mean, it's it's crazy to go through and and uh, get my uh, my fix of reading all the comments because it's uh, it's a situation where people just love what he's doing and love how he's portraying uh, his character, and it's all genuine because that's uh, exactly who he is. Yeah. And he's a role model now to so many uh, kids. And I'm sure he'll be start to become more aware of that as fan mail and things come in. Uh, you know, this, this storyline is just sort of beginning on general hospital. So as, as it goes, uh, I think he'll, he'll realize, and I, and I, I've seen him, you know, he put a little post up and you can see how positive he is and how positive he is for o- other kids. So, uh, you know, we're talking about how, uh, negative all the bullet boys drama is you know and all the nonsense and then you talk about how positive the situation uh, with your son and, and his budding career is well a subplot to that is that i was hoping with bullet boys if we could have extended this that we could also do some autism autism awareness work uh, by virtue of the band and, and so i was looking forward to that as well so you know that comes off as a as a disappointment but like you said there's um there's a lot of positivity, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can't, you know, obviously autism um, affects so many people, and so many people that I've interviewed. Uh, I had Tommy Theo on the show from Tesla, and I believe he has two children who have it. And so it's 
it affects so many lives. And so the best thing to do is talk about awareness and let people know that they're not alone in this situation and that there are uh, people like your son who triumph in it. And are really, like I said, inspiring so many people. Yeah, it's it's amazing to realize how many people are affected by this and in many different ways, as I've said. And I, I remember when I was a kid, I was asked to mentor somebody who was clearly autistic at the time and, and pretty high on the spectrum. And he was having a difficult time with people picking on him. And it was just horrible for me to, to witness that. And I did what I could to help him. But, you know, even then, no, that word didn't even exist in our lexicon. So um, it, it has a special uh, resonance in my heart, you know, to see my son doing well and, uh, and being, like you said, very optimistic and, and uh, positive about his situation. Yeah. How old is he? He's 10 right now. Yeah, I mean, how how great to uh, to have that. So I want to make sure we talked about that because there's definitely a lot of positivity going on, not just the Bullet Boys. And like you, we've said, as far as Bullet Boys goes, this is not shocking. Uh, it certainly wasn't shocking to you. You went in and open minded. You gave it your best shot. A lot of things happened again, and and you're out. Tell me about what the plans are for you professionally now. Well, I'm in the process of mixing the Hot Summers record that's been in the can for a while. So uh, the problem is that we keep writing new songs and it's going to be a triple record by the time we're done. So we, we have to sort of find a way to, to quit uh, coming up with new material and get this uh, record done. So we're in the uh, last mile of that. I'm finishing up mixes as we speak and hopefully uh, that'll be done in the next month or so. And then we can talk about how we're going to release it because it's a whole new landscape, as everybody knows. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for doing everything yourself. Certainly uh, in our experience, nobody is willing to jump on your train and help you until it's actually moving down the track at a fast clip. Nobody wants to push. So um, that's the scenario that we're in. And hopefully everybody will jump on and, and give us a hand and get this record uh, heard. Well, it's great music, and it's really, uh, you know, if, if you're a fan of big hooks and sort of uh, that a, a classic rock 80s, you know, sound, I think people really like it. We'll put the link down so people can hear some of the Hot Summer's uh, music, and I think it's something that would go well. I think that, uh, you know, in a lot of the same festivals and places that would have had Bullet Boys, I think would love to have the Hot Summer's, and I think a lot of the fans will will dig this music. I think... The hardest thing about this show is when I hear people's new music, I go, boy, I sure hope there's a hook, you know? I, yeah. <laughs> and in a hook, you, you guys have, uh, you know, everything. It's just catchy and fun and an easy listen. And I think um, other people enjoy that. And so like you said, now it's a matter of getting it, getting it done and getting it out. Yep. So thank and, you. I appreciate that, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was the plan all along. I, I think the Bullet Boy shows were sporadic and they were there and, it, you know, it was good. But the plan was to get this record out. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, I didn't have to do any of that Bullet Boy stuff. I, I was really looking forward to it being fun. And uh, as I've told you before, I love playing with those guys. I mean, Jimmy and Lonnie uh, just bring out something. I think each of us brings out uh, something that... Uh, can't be found anywhere else. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I'm sorry to see it end, but at the same time, uh, I'm relieved and don't have to worry about it anymore. And I can move on to, you know, things that are much healthier. Yeah. And I'm assuming you and Jimmy, uh, Jimmy are, are speaking that you sort of timed your announcements similar, similar. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy and I are uh, on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so maybe there's a chance you guys work together on something else. Well, we'll see. I'm not sure if that'll happen, but we'll definitely be at the Rainbow having pizza at some point. Yeah, that's that's always a good thing. And that's yeah. probably the safest thing. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, as far as uh as far as working together. So, um I'm glad that you sort of told people, you know, your your involvement in what is to uh what's to to happen. And you know, People have the old records and they have the old memories. I, I told the story in the first interview. I got to see you guys play at CBGB's in New York City uh, on an off night on the Poison Tour. Someone in Poison got sick and uh, you guys got to play uh, CBGB's. Maybe there was 50 people there. It wasn't really announced. It was just like this kind of thing. And so, you know, we, we have those memories. I know that people who did see the reunion shows enjoyed them. 
but uh, the music that you made um, is, is still there and uh, probably less dramatic. Well, the truth is I came into this wondering myself if there was a market, if there was an audience, if, if we'd be well received. And uh, the answer to that ended up being a resounding yes, because all the, the festivals and the sheds that we played uh, came off really well. So, uh, yeah, I was as surprised as anybody. Mick, do you ever get these offers from other bands that need someone to fill in, like, uh, you know, a White Snake or somebody, uh, one of these bands that changes guys? Yeah, I've, I've gotten some calls here and there, but that's that's really not my thing. I, um, I'm not looking forward to you know playing someone else's material like that you know there's still a couple of things that are outstanding right now that that may or may not happen um so we'll see if that ends up uh changing in the future but yeah i always figured it'd be cool to play with cheryl crow at some point but that beyond that i don't know yeah so i mean <laughs> you're looking to do uh you're up to play some music with other people but maybe not play with some of your peers that you and things you've done already yeah, that's that's really not me. I mean, it's it's great for the guys that do it, and it looks like it's a lot of fun. Uh, but I never really considered myself a side guy. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I talked to people, and I, I had Stephen Piercy on last week, and we were talking about: Are there any bands that are coming out now that can survive ten years? Can they survive twenty years? Can they survive five years? Is there any music that you're listening to um, that you go, wow, this is this is great? Oh my god, dude, I'm I'm still listening to my ELP records. In fact, I've, I'm experiencing a renaissance, and uh, it's kind of crazy. I, my, you know, my wife will look in and like, oh my god, what the hell is that? It sounds mm -hmm. like a combination of like Starsky and Hutch and porn music. But you know, I grew up on it, and to me, it still resonates. So, um, geez. Beyond that, I've just been mixing so much. I haven't had a chance to listen to much of anything. I, I'm with you. When people talk about new music, and I'm sure there's a lot out there, although it's harder to find, I'm still rediscovering old Johnny Thunder's live concerts and other things that I missed. and so, Or still finding my favorite bands all over again. So it's, it's a hard time um, to find new music, although I'm sure it's out there. There's younger people who could tell us, you know, 20 new bands. And, and hopefully the music that's coming out now, the music that, you know, we're sitting around going like, oh my God, is anybody going to even remember this song in a year? Um, hopefully, you know, that'll be the case and it'll it'll live forever. But I think there's a reason that class, classic rock is so popular. And I think there's a reason that people go back to uh, music like I do, because they're, you know, when you hear something current and modern, there's just, there's something about it that doesn't, doesn't resonate. It doesn't, touch your heart and it could be that you know the fact that we're just older and we're not as impressionable who knows but uh you know i i certainly appreciate the uh the level of uh quality you know the recording process back then obviously was was much different much more difficult much more challenging and you know i have a deep appreciation for that as well yeah i i think uh yeah, it's a it's a it's a different world. Occasionally, I hear something and I go, "Wow, that's a great song." And I'm thinking, I don't want to get too attached to this because I don't think this band is going to uh, 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 be around. And then it's funny is that you meet younger people who discover uh, the Bullet Boys and you know all of the sort of '87 to '91, '92 hard rock bands, and they're living it. They're living it like it's new. It, it, it's almost uh, shocking at times, you know that. Some of the bands, even some of the smaller bands, I'm thinking, people tell me, I go, well, I didn't even know that band mattered then, but there's this whole resurgence. Yeah, there were teenagers at our shows. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of crazy, you know, when you're you're talking to their mom and she was a fan way back when, and you know, there's a 17 year old kid just standing there going like, oh my God, that's you, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I've seen it and I see it at the shows uh, that I go to and, out touring, uh, you know, I'm tour managing Stephen Piercy, and when I see the fans, there's 18 year old kids who know rat songs, you know, and I'm talking about the yeah. deep cuts, you know, they, they know yeah. the deep cuts too. So uh, it's it's funny, you know, either the new rock and roll's got to step up their game, or maybe just the old rock and roll um, was that good. Yeah, either way, it gives you hope. You know, there's a sense of uh, sense of optimism that you know people understand what we understand. 
Yeah, a- 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 absolutely. It's uh, and it's hard to if as fans are learning, it's hard. What's best for the fan is not always what's best for the band. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, and you you gave it your be- you gave it your best shot. You gave it the college try again, and uh, sometimes these problems um, repeat themselves. Uh, it is what it is. It won't change uh, that you, what you're doing in the new music, The Hot Summers. I want to make sure, again, we mentioned that and that also people can take a look uh, in the description. Here's some of that music. Build some anticipation for uh, an upcoming release, hopefully later this year, right? Yeah, if uh, if not sooner than that. I'm expecting it to be much sooner. And, and at that point, obviously, we'll be looking to play some shows. We've got a couple of shows booked already. Um, so we'll need to find the right bass player, the right drummer, and if uh, somebody's interested, feel free to reach out. Yeah, especially someone who makes their flight, though. That's a pre- prerequisite, right? Yeah, that's preferred. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Mick, thank you so much for coming on, clearing up some of those things. And I look forward to having you back when it's time to talk about the Hot Summers. And I look forward to seeing uh, the success of that band, because that, that would, that's what we, uh, what we really need. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, best of luck to you and and the show, too. I I appreciate being here. Great. Thanks, Mick. Okay. Thanks, brother.